Hello, I'm Kamla. My guests today are relatives of the famous jazz musician, composer, and band leader Miles Davis. Erin Davis and Vince Wilburn Jr. are here at the San Francisco International Film Festival to show the documentary that Stanley Nelson produced and directed. Welcome to San Francisco. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. So, what did you think of the film? Oh, we loved it. I, I mean, I loved it. I thought it was well done. Uh, it was emotional. It's uh, it's very inf inf informative. Uh, it's got all the great music. Yeah, it's great. What about you? That was incredible. And okay. every time we, I've seen it three times, and every time I see it, I get something different from it. Okay, so Stanley, Stanley did a remarkable job. Yeah, and uh, Stanley Nelson is an award-winning uh, filmmaker. And what was interesting is just two years ago there was a feature film on your father, and now this documentary. And I'm wondering why. Oh, well, well, it was 2016, three years ago when the film came out. Uh, we've worked on that for years and years, and uh, it took a long time uh, to get, you know, funding and everything together for that. So uh, after that, we were, we were available to work on the documentary, and uh, Stanley came with all the ducks in place. <laughs> okay. And both of you grew up with him in different times that is you are the nephew yes uh miles davis's sister's son yes so you grew up knowing him far longer than erin did <laughs> well don't say far longer because it, 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 it's like is that not right? we, we always tease each other about age yeah don't say that erin's like my little brother okay more than a cousin but yeah yeah true true yeah, yeah. So far longer I, when he showed me a, he showed, okay okay can we edit it no <laughs> No, when Aaron, I think this, when, when Uncle Miles showed me a Polaroid, he said, you got a little cousin. i never forget, I was so excited to meet him, you know, because I was, you know, teenager. Of, of an age. Of an age. Of an age. And well, I was excited, you know, it's like, Aaron, I just can't wait to meet him. But what do you remember of him? What are the first early memories of uh, him? Aaron? No, not Aaron. Of of, yeah, of your uncle. I grew up in Chicago. Before TSA, you could go to the gate to, to meet your, your, you know, people who flew in, Chicago O'Hare. So as a kid, I would go with my parents to meet Uncle Miles at the gate. And, and every few steps coming back from, from, the, from, the, from the gate to the, to the car, people would stop him. And I was like, wow, why, why are they always stopping Uncle Miles? So I didn't know what, what it was. And even going to the concerts and being on the side of the stage, because I didn't want to sit in the audience. I just remember like the silhouette and this man that, with the trumpet and, and how, you know, how it had an effect on me. So I'm sure it had an effect, as a kid, I'm sure it had an effect on the, the world. But it was just like little things like that. It's like, that, that stand out, you know, like a superhero, like a, like a larger than life person who was my uncle. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. You know? And as yeah. a kid, I'm like, wow. And then we'd always look forward, I have a person who looked forward to him coming to Chicago. Was he very stylish? Oh yeah, 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 definitely. So he was cool. Yeah, cool. Always cool. Always cool. Yeah. <laughs> and what about you? What are your early memories? Oh, my early memories um, are at his place uh, in New York on the west side. Um, he had a very cool, uh, he bought the building. He bought a brownstone. So he had this really cool uh, house there. And uh, I remember seeing his music and not getting it at all. I was like, too little. To, to understand what's going on. And then, um, you know, he called me when he, when he uh, started playing again. He came out of his brief uh, retirement uh, or hiatus. And, um, you know, he just started with Man with the Horn, uh, with Vince, and, and he, he done a, did an album called We Want Miles, which was a live album of his, sort of his comeback, if you want to call it that or whatever. Is this in the 80s? Yeah. Yeah, and uh, so my earliest memories of are him are hanging out in New York, uh, going to the the UN to the he used to go to the Ambassadors Club to swim, and have lunch. And I remember doing that, and then I started going on the road with him in the summers. And Vince was in the band, and uh, I later on joined the band. When did you get his music then? When did I get it? Because he said early on you didn't get his music. Well, I mean, I was like you know three or four, and I was like I don't know. He was three and four, and he got his first set no, of drums. Didn't you yeah, get your five? Five in kindergarten. Okay. Yeah. But 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 
Well, he was playing the, when I was like three or four, he was playing the stuff that was like on the corner mm -hmm. and after that. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I was a little, I didn't really quite get it then, I don't think, when I was little. And then later on, it was great to kind of come back to it. So um, one of the things that is uh, that that he wrote in his uh, autobiography is, it is the first thing in my life, music, and I go to bed thinking about music. It is always there, comes before everything. What instances of what he's talking about do you remember? Because he went to bed thinking about music, he woke up about thinking about music, and he said the only constant was change. You had to change. Right. Mm -hmm. What are your memories of him thinking about music? It was his life. You know, I lived with Aaron and, and Uncle Miles, and this, it was, his, his, it was his, his existence was music. I mean, he had outside interests, of course, but, you know, he would have the board tape, the concerts, he'd playing on, on the stereo in the house. He would have, if it was like MTV back in the 80s, he would have the sound turned down. If it was something you watched like, MTV? With the sound down, maybe, or it would sound low. But he'd have the, he'd listen to his own music, then if it was something that attracted him, he'd have to turn the sound up or have us turn the sound up. And then he would ask the record company to send him that, that particular group's music, you know. But always thinking about music. You know, that's just a, little, a small part. But always thinking about music, constantly in some way, some form, some daily, it was all about music, you know. And he also liked rock and roll? Everything. Every, everything. He liked everything. He, yeah. yeah. When we grew up, there was the radio. Mm. So so you listen to more things that you might listen to now. And then there was MTV and you had everything on there. Mm -hmm. So you'd find stuff you liked that you didn't think you might like or, you know, whatever. Uh, but I think with him, it was, an, I don't think, he, he really didn't... Um, he didn't like genres, you know, pulling music into categories, even though it helps for discussion purposes. But, you know, he liked musicians and music, you know. So his imagination was very fluid, which means the boundaries were also fluid. That yeah. is, he didn't like yeah. genres. Yeah. Like yeah, I mean, one of his good friends was Willie Nelson. Yeah. You know, yeah. they, they did. Willie Nelson? <laughs> group, remember the group Kassav? I think he went yeah. to see Kassav. Um, yeah. um, um, you know. And he played with hip -hop, Prince. Hip-hop, Prince. Script, um, um, Mr. Mister, the group called Mr. Mister, the Toto, he played with Toto, Cameo. Yeah. So he you played know. with uh, all sorts of uh, musicians. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Tell us about Prince, because I think he he had a special place in his heart for Prince. Indeed. Yeah. Uh, go ahead. They, 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 they must have been related in another life or something. <laughs> Why yeah. do you say that? <laughs> because they were, they just got each other. You know, they, you know, they had this great working relationship, you know, send them. Prince would send him all these tapes, send him all kinds of music, and you know they um, they were they were really close. A lot right? of love, yeah. Uh, he, he, Prince also he anonymously donated, you know, contributed to the Miles Ahead. A lot of people don't know that. Well, he didn't, Prince, he didn't, he didn't care to be public. Public, and he didn't want it to go public. But now it's public. Now we're talking about it. But he's, he, they had that type of relationship, you know. So and Uncle Miles played his at, a, at his party, right? His, yeah, his birthday. Yeah, Prince's birthday. Oh, okay. Yeah, so, so it was it was admiration and love for each other. Okay, when you look back, you know, uh, at your uncle, mm -hmm. what are some of the strong memories that come to you, and what is it that this film brought back to you? <laughs> because you know, it traces his life sure. from birth to sure. him passing away. His honesty, he wasn't perfect, you know. It 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 it, it a lot of I don't like the Prince of Darkness and. And he wasn't a, you know, he couldn't talk to him. He was, he's just a man, you know, and, and, and with his beliefs. And and he believed in this music. This music was powerful. His music was powerful. And, and he and he wanted to change, you know, at all. You know, he did, he sacrificed a lot to make this music. In what ways? Just family, marriages, you know. It's, 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 it was like, that was, that was the most important thing in his world. He loved Aaron, he loved me, he loved his family, but I mean, this man was driven by music. He said if he didn't have music, he would have died. But what about the other side of him where he raised his hand? Uh, the violent side? Yeah. Did you ever see that? I mean, the, because the movie uh, talks about it sure. quite a bit, yeah, you know, sure. so if, if you didn't know, it comes as a bit of a shock. I, I mean, I, I've never seen him do anything like, like anything physical to anybody. I've seen him get very upset. 
You know, I mean, I get upset, but, you know, uh, you know, I think when I was around, he wasn't, you know, I mean, I think it was a different time. I mean, yeah. I, I'm not making excuses for him, but, beha- you know, behaviorally, I, th- I think he was just younger and more frustrated when he was older. I don't think he was, you know, he was already established. I, I don't know. I don't want to make any excuses about it, honestly. Um, you know, Frank, we just, Francis just passed away, you know, uh, with Thanksgiving. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Francis Taylor. So um, I'm not making any excuses or anything. I'm just saying that uh, I never really saw him do anything like that. Yeah. Did he ever I, I talk about his parents? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 It was, it was Because in, in in the documentary, it starts off by saying that uh, uh, Miles Davis witnessed uh, yeah. acrimony between his father and mother. He never talked about he that. He never talked though. about that. And and we never saw him. I never. Aaron didn't see it. And. And, and my, I never saw him being physical towards women. I remember that if it happened, I remember phone calls in the middle of the night and you know, his girlfriends would call my mom and, and my mom would kind of calm him down. But you, 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 got, you have to remember that was the 70s. That was with the drugs and the alcohol. And, but when, when Aaron and I spent a lot of time with him, he was drinking Perrier and painting. And, yeah, huh? You know, it's a different time. So we didn't really, we never saw the physical you know, we're not shying away from it or, or, or denouncing it or anything, but we never experienced that that physical abuse that he. Do you ever go to schools and give talks on Miles Davis and jazz? I talked to kids in Germany once, and they had these little glockenspiels and stuff, and they were playing. So what? When I walked in the room, that was in Germany, and then I just spoke at USC the, uh, for the jazz department, and they were, you know, they they were prepared. Before you know, they read up with social media, so you know they they read about the man and they and they have questions for us or for me when when I spoke, but I think it's cha- it's changing now, so so we want to do more. We want to speak more to the kids because that's that's our future. Yeah. So you guys are in charge of the Miles Davis Foundation along with your sister. Yeah, that's just that's just we haven't even really started it yet. Mm-hmm. Oh, we haven't. No, that's mm-hmm. coming up. Though. Okay. Mm-hmm. So because you're in charge of his heritage and his legacy and his music and everything, mm-hmm. so you're probably constantly looking at how can we repackage this or how can we introduce Miles Davis's music to a newer audience. That's why I asked the question, right. when you go, how do you introduce Miles Davis to an audience that doesn't know him? Well, Because the people that knew him are fast mm-hmm. fading, right? Mm-hmm. Well, sometimes you need to bring maybe someone in who's contemporary to to show people what he's done or, uh, you know, to, to do a collaboration. You know, like Robert, we brought in Robert Glasper. He did a collaboration they called Everything's Beautiful. He also worked on the film's score. And, uh, you know, uh, Vince reached out to Q-Tip, and he's, he's working on a In, in a Silent Way uh, remix. Uh, it's be coming out soon. So. so that's one way. I mean, another way is just um, information, you know. Um, you know, merchandising. Like, there's just all kinds of ways, you know. Um, you know I, I, I like to reach the kids... That are that are in their teens, you know, that to because those are the ones who are really discovering what music they like, what they don't like. They don't want to have to listen to what their parents say they should listen to. And you know, when I find teens that that are in the miles, I just love that. You know. <laughs> Do you play music now? Me personally, yeah, I play uh, drums and guitar. I don't play out anymore as much, but uh, but yeah, I still play. I still keep all my best instruments still. <laughs> and you listen to his music. Oh yeah, all the time. Yeah, yeah I, I got. I have Siri play it for me. Oh Siri, <laughs> well, I, I wonder what your dad would have thought of uh, this new social media, iPhone, and everything. Uh, what his reaction would be? <laughs> He probably would have purchased this. Like, I, got a, I got a camera on my phone. He would have. Uh, we used to go through all his Walkman. You know, he used to. Do, we have a, a, an ongoing joke about the headphones. He'd break the the headphones and the the. the uh, the uh, Walkmans and we replace them. He must have like went, gone through seventy five Walkmans. Seventy five. No, I'm mean, just being. You know, <laughs> Nobody went through a lot of Walkmans. So he would have been like, yeah. give, "Give me another iPhone." Yeah, right. <laughs> Did he like the Walkman? He, he liked yeah. the fact that he could he could record the show that he played yeah. and then listen to it right afterwards. <laughs> you know, without having to have a reel to reel tape or something. You know, just like board tape, cassette right there. You could listen to everybody. You know. Talk to the guys about what what's working, what he wants to change. You know, I think he liked that. You know, the fact that it was portable. Yeah. All you need was batteries. 
And your and your headphones. Yeah. And he, and, you know, <laughs> I, I used to love when we would sit in, on the plane and it would be so loud, everybody could hear it. And, and, yeah. And, Through the headphones? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> then if he wanted you to work on something on the music, he'd take the headphones and they'd be wet. <laughs> Put them on your hand, you know. But it was, just, you know, I think he would dig the, the technology now. He'd be pro probably trying to use it to, his, you know. Yeah. He was always, he was, he was lucky. He, he, he never looked back. He was always looking to the future. So the technology. That was the most interesting thing that you said in an interview that he didn't want to have his old records and listen to his old music. It was all about now and the future. Yeah, no, no. I mean, if, if I would have went to the store and bought ESP and be like, can you tell me about this? No, <laughs> right. just listen to it later. Yeah. Like, just, yeah. He was only really interested in talking about, I mean, he could get him to talk about the players, you know, the guys. Like, he used to paint and talk about, like, uh, Bird and mm. Philly Joe. Mm -hmm. And these guys all became, like, I mean, they are legends, but legends to me because of how funny the stories were, mm -hmm. you know? And, um, you know, Max Roach yeah. and uh, Kenny Train Clark, yeah. and yeah, Kenny Clark. Uh, he used to talk about Clark Terry. Oh, yeah. You know, uh, yeah. guys he, he respected, guys that were older than him, you know. I, one time I was in a, uh, we were on the road, we were in Amsterdam, and I went swimming, and this older gentleman, uh, I, you know, he was an African-American guy, and we're, we're both in the pool, and he's like, I told him who I was, and he goes, oh, yeah, my name is Nick. Tell him, tell your dad Big Nick says hello, and he, and he almost fell over laughing, thinking about Big Nick. He played baritone sax, wow. and he was doing this funny impression of him playing, and he was like, tell Big Nick to come up here, you know, like... Wow. <laughs> He never said, well, you know, back when I did uh, uh, ESP, I was thinking I let the boys stretch out on the tunes. No, no, no. Just, just talking about the guys themselves. If you want to hear the music, it's there. You'd always say that. It's there. Why are you playing that? It's there. You know, I've already done that. You know, well, you check out what I'm doing now. You know. And, and what I used to dig, he used to ask Aaron, what, what did he like? You know, Aaron would have his own turntable in his room. I mean, his own component set. And he was interested in what Aaron was listening to, what I was listening to. You know, that's kind of cool, you know. Yeah. What do you like? So yeah. that's how he kept up. Well, I mean, yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, yeah. like, he kept up on Magazine, his own, yeah. ask you, yeah. you know. Okay. Even when he wasn't, when he wasn't working, like, in the, in the periods in the 70s, he would show up at a club and everybody would know Mouse is here. You know, he's, and he'd leave, you know, like, hang and out he, the back and, of the club. and he liked to cook? I oh. love to cook, yeah. That was the surprising thing, oh. that he liked to cook, and he had secret recipes, I think one of you mentioned. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> or both of you. A little phone book, like we're trying to find a menu, this little book with all these recipes. Oh, yeah. Booyah base, uh, pasta, fish. So um, he was a good cook. Oh, yeah. Incredible. Did he make any desserts? Uh, Mom, well, he no. wasn't really supposed to have desserts because he was diabetic. Yeah. No. So, no. <laughs> but your, <laughs> fond, was your fond food memories. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. He, he made this, uh, he would make chili. He would make bouillabaisse, like you said. Uh, he would make barbecue, too, sometimes. But the only time he didn't is when Vince's dad would come visit us. Then he would defer to Vince Wilburn <laughs> Sr., <laughs> the oh. grill master. So, so that, you know, and uh, I mean, even, even just how he used to make burgers was, like, interesting, you know. Okay. Uh, he made corn, like, fried cornbread. And Oof, just all kinds of stuff, yeah. Yeah. Okay. And I want to ask you a question about shoes. Sure. Apparently, your dad would say that you can tell the nature of a man. I think I'm paraphrasing. You can tell a lot about somebody by their shoes. By their shoes. You can tell a lot. Yeah. And so you're wearing some funky shoes today. Yeah. Um, uh, <laughs> so you picked that. <laughs> <laughs> so you picked that up from uh, your dad, this habit of uh, choosing a shoe? Well, uh, sometimes my personal styles, I like to be subtle. Except for one thing, maybe my shoes can be bright or loud or different. Uh, that's my personal style, but he said that you know before because he would say like the man makes his shoes, or you know you can tell a lot about somebody by their shoes. You know, you know you can tell what they care about, what they don't. You know, these kind of things. So I always kind of took that to heart. You know. So if somebody was wearing a good pair of shoes, that means they took good care of themselves? It, uh, How does that translate? It, it's more like if you're, wearing, if you're wearing super comfortable shoes, you can, you can tell that they just want to be comfortable. They don't care what the shoes look like. like they might look like pillows wrapped around your feet. You, know, you never know. You know, if you're wearing like 
leather shoes that look really uncomfortable. You want them to look good. You want people to know you like the way they look, regardless of how much is really killing your feet. You know, <laughs> so you can tell things about people. You know, and he was also fond of clothes. Of course, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. He was very stylish. Uh, he he used to give me some of his old stuff. I, I love getting it. You know, we used to, I can't believe we were the same size at one point. Not anymore, but. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. Uh, turning back to you, he got you your first drum kit? Well, I, he told my mom to get an in, purchase an inexpensive kit. And then if I showed like I wanted to really play, then he would get the next kit. And did you so, show interest? Oh, yeah. Tore him up. Yeah, yeah. I was to, to rip him apart. <laughs> and so he gave you your first... Uh... Yes. My dad bought a Ludwig kit for me. Uh -huh. And then Uncle Miles gave me a Yamaha kit. Okay. Yeah. And then when you were, uh, I think, in your teens and a little bit older, mm -hmm. you had a group. Mm -hmm. And apparently you would call your mom and say, put the, put phone. the phone. Yeah, and, and, have, and, and listen to us and critique us at the end of the rehearsal. What were some of the critiques he gave you that helped you all improve your music? You know, uh, <laughs> we had a saxophonist. I don't want to name his name. <laughs> he was struggling. So he would tell him to get his sound together and... and um, you know, bass, try to tell the bass player to try this, you know, try Randy, you know, just musician to musician, constructive criticism. And and we would work on it. And so he, I guess he heard the development in the band because he'd call every day, you know, and then one day he just said, you guys want to make a record. How First lucky, year. I mean, you're such a lucky person that you had an uncle who would listen to you on the phone. Yeah, and yeah, it was, it was a blessing. It's a blessing and it is as enormous as it is when I talk about it now. But then it was just like Uncle Miles was calling. We had to be on. We had to be. We were already serious, but knowing that he was listening, we had to really be on it. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? We couldn't be fluffing. You know, we couldn't fluff. You know, you know, mess up the music. Not. We took the music rehearsal seriously. We were just teenagers. So his criticism was honest. Very honest. And you could uh, take it. We had to. I don't, Why, think, he, yeah. I don't think he found any reason not to no, be honest with somebody. No. No. So he was time, honest man. with Aaron. He was honest with me. He was honest with all the musicians, Herbie, everybody, Tony, Jack, you know, Train, everybody. You know, he said when in the documentary he mentioned about Train. You know, he, he said Train was playing to himself and he made a change. He was, he, you know, he was, he was, he was. The, the criticism that he gave the band was was to better us as musicians, and it did. You know, we loved it. I call it Miles Davis University. Mm -hmm. you, know. <laughs> you, you, you were very lucky to have somebody like yeah, him. Bless. Yeah, definitely. Uh, help you. I'm How lucky to have this guy right here who's like a brother to me. <laughs> and I'm, I'm blessed to, to have, have, have uh, Uncle Miles as my uncle. What do you miss about him? I miss his humor. Is like mm. just sitting with him and, uh, you know, watching him draw something or, uh, you know, uh, just... Uh, I feel like I learned so much just by hanging out with him, doing nothing, like mm. just eating. Or you know, I remember it was just he, he called me up to his room. We were in Nice at this hotel, the Grand Hotel in Nice, and I was like, "Wow, it's so great here! It's like tropical almost, and it's you know, it's, it's just what's wonderful down there in the south of France." And, and he was eating a, a salad niçoise, and I never seen one. And he said, "Oh, I'll get you one." So he ordered one up, and I. I always remember that, you know, that was the first time I had that or, you know, I, I remember the first time I watched him make a Caesar salad dressing and I was like, what is he doing? Like, this looks disgusting. Like, what is all this stuff going in here? And it was, it was delicious, you know, uh, just like stuff like that. So, and you, of course, miss him for all the feedback he gave you. And the no, I miss him for just being, you know, just, we could, the three of us could watch a fight. And not say a word for half an hour. Really? Yeah, yeah we watch boxing, and he'd make the uh, big bowl of popcorn. That moment in time, we could never get back again, and that was enough for me. He didn't have to say anything; just sitting here at, with Aaron, and, and oh, he would give us some pointers on, you know, he said, "Stand up." <laughs> then he shows us, yeah. put, you know, put your fist up, put your cards. And I mean, but those little things is that's what I miss. Did he watch know? films? Yeah. yeah. No, so yeah. did he? Did you all see Raging Bull together? No. You know what? I think I did see it with him. I didn't see him. I saw some of it with him. I mean, but but he would have him on and he wouldn't be like screening it. He would just kind of have it on and he would look up now and then. He would be drawing usually or, or painting. 
Uh, you know what I mean? He wasn't. It wasn't like I need to sit down and watch this entire film frame to frame. You know, it was just he like little boxing tapes, right? Yeah. Sugar Ray Robinson well, was different. his man. Those yeah. are, those Sugar were like Ray. on. You know, we had a stack of. Why did he like boxing? Because it's, it's, it's kind of a science. You know, it's like yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's man and your body and you think you think you think of you don't have to think. You know. Yeah. I he think. was smart. He was. You know, he's a smart man. He made us think. He would throw things at us to make us think. He didn't like lazy. He didn't like you to waste a day ever. You know, make it count. Make every day count. Do something productive in your day. We so, didn't. We didn't sit around in, in Malibu. So even when he was down and out, and you know, he was uh, having problems with health and everything, he made that day count. Well, we weren't around him. When you say down and out, what do you mean? When like, he was taking his, uh, when he was addicted to drugs and stuff well, like that. Well, I don't think Aaron was. Well, around. that was like a different time yeah. in his life, you know. But I'm talking about when we were, you know, all living together. You know, that's what we're, we're drawing from. That. It's two. It's two different. When he was down and out, my my mom would let me experience a little bit of it, but she didn't want me to see that side. So I would just not want him to do drugs because I didn't like the what it made him. You know, but it, the way it turned him into a bad person. And I know that he would regret it after he stopped it, you know, when he was sober up. But we were never, the, the, the times we were with him were very constructive and positive and, and laughing and, and the music. And he wanted Aaron and I to be serious about the music and, you know. But the dark times were, were I just remember phone calls in the middle of the night to my mom, you know, my mom flying up to New York and straightening things out. Because he 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 looked at, he looked up to my mom because my mom would fly to New York and get it, you know, you know, take care of it, you know, deal with the girls, you know, wherever he was having physical uh, confrontations with, and deal with Uncle Miles, you know. So it's different different times. I don't know what you think we're shying away and we don't want no, to ever no, talk no. about. No, no, you answered the question. Yeah. You answered the question. But it hurt. It hurt me to see him with with the, in that in that period. It hurt me bad, you know. And he knew it, you know. We miss him, and we love him, and and that's the way I do the way I want to remember him. Not the not the drug part, but the you know. But I want to thank you for talking to us about uh, Miles Davis, thank you. your father and your uncle, who taught you about music. Yeah. And, about life, <laughs> and and life and food and art, yeah. and that funky red uh, trumpet that he had. Oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. And thank you for watching. We'll be back again next week with another new conversation. And if you missed any of our shows, you can watch them on our website. Until next time, goodbye.